I'm with Armanino. I am the family office lead for Armanino. And today I am with uh, two of my colleagues, Ben Laird and B Jason Bullinger. And they focus on valuations and appraisals. And the reason we're talking with them today is just the, the, the sense of urgency that everybody in the estate planning community has given that the, the current elevated uh, 13.6 million or 27.2 million as a married couple uh, lifetime exclusions is, is due to sunset at the end of 2025. And given a change in the president, it's possible that we could get a retroactive back to January 1st, 2024. A change in that lifetime exclusion. So anybody that has left over lifetime ex or remaining lifetime ex exclusion right now uh, should be thinking about doing some estate planning and valuations and approvals. Uh, appraisals are, are um, key elements to many of those techniques. Uh, so Jason, if you could give me your background, why don't we start there? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. So um, my name is Jason Bollinger. I'm the co-leader of our national valuation practice here at Armenino. I've uh, been valuing businesses for, for over 15 years, privately held businesses, primarily in the uh, gift and estate tax context. So familiar with discount studies that would go along with uh, legal entity valuations. So we do a lot of calculating uh, discounts for lack of control, lack of marketability on privately held entities that are both uh, asset holding companies, but also operating entities themselves as well. That's great. Yeah, we'll get into uh, some of the details on, on what, what those expected value, uh, expected discounts could be for lack of control, lack of liquidity, all, all of those types of things and the, the various scenarios. But before we jump into that, Ben, if you could give us a little bit about your background, that would be super helpful. Sure. Um my name is Ben Laird. I'm the national practice leader for the real estate valuation group at Armanino. We hold underneath the valuation group that Jason is the, the co-leader on. Been in the commercial real estate appraisal space for roughly about 30 years now. So kind of dating myself there, but that also brings with it plenty of experience. Uh, a significant amount of experience with gift and estate work, as well as traditional valuation, valuation for purchase price allocation, litigation, expert witness testimony. But as Chris is alluding to, the, the times come where I think we, we need to put this at the forefront of our discussions. Right on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if one or both of you can explain to us what a valuation and appraisal are and how they're and why they're important in estate planning. You know that that would be great. Why don't Why don't we start with uh, with Jason? Yeah. So uh, obviously, any part of anytime you're moving assets out of your estate, one of the key items to understand is what is the value of what you're moving outside of your estate. So appraisals become become pretty integral parts of any estate planning that you're doing, so that you can quantify what that is. When you talk about that lifetime exemption, you have to know how much of that exemption you're using up with any particular gift. And an appraisal, and more particularly a qualified appraisal, is going to help you quantify that. Right. So, so okay, so that, that's, that's helpful. I mean, ben, what's the difference between a valuation and an appraisal? So that's a good question. Both are essentially opinions of value. Um, by definition, and an appraisal is an opinion of value given by a real estate appraiser. And depending on what state it's in, a uh, person may or may not need to be a certified general licensed real estate appraiser. But at the end of the day, Jason hit on the topic, it needs to be a, a qualified appraisal. So okay. for the IRS has a specific set of guidelines that you could have 100 very well qualified appraisers out there, but if they're not familiar with the nuances associated with gift and estate, they might miss a few little items here and there that's going to red flag that appraisal. 
for a, a deeper dive and a potential audit. So you definitely want to make sure that whomever you're using, if it's not Armanino, whoever you decide to use for the real estate component, that that person understands the nuances associated with gift and estate. Because a traditional valuation that you might use for purchase price allocation work, a restricted appraisal report, that's not going to fly for something that's gift and estate related or IRS purposes. Right. So are there specific rules for gift and estate tax purposes that 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 change the the, the valuation given the opinion of value is going to be the same it's really the level of documentation that you're giving within the appraisal report so the person reviewing it at the IRS had can come to a conclusion they can follow your thought process and come to the same conclusion that you're coming to a restricted appraisal report you're definitely not going to have that level of information in it by uniform standards of professional appraisal practices, which is USPAP, they have some certain guidelines in effect, but the IRS guidelines go a little bit above and beyond that for certain aspects. Instead of reporting a three-year history, uh, you have to report a five-year history because the IRS definitely wants to take a look back and see if there's any properties that were gifted out of an estate to kind of disguise or, or lower a person's actual a value of their historical estate. So, and some of those, if it's done, say, four years ago, they can be clawed back into maybe not the estate, but if there's some type of penalties owed to the, the IRS, they can definitely claw those back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, what types of assets, or let me ask this, so Jason, what is the wildest asset that you've ever valued for estate and gift purposes? So one of the wildest things that I've ever valued was a cemetery, which was, was fascinating. And actually, it dips in a little bit into a real estate appraisal, which is what Ben does. But we were valuing just the operations of the cemetery. And uh, it was one of those things where you have to really kind of understand the economics of a cemetery and how it works and what's required in it and how they how they make money. So was it a combination of like discounted cash flow, like as well as comps or how or was it there's a dollar per per body or some other valuation metric that cemeteries are that, that they use for cemeteries? Yeah, well, yeah, it was a little bit of both. So it's it's basically it's a it's a capacity constraint, right? So um, when you think about land, oh, right, you have a finite amount of land, right? Yeah. So it's how many you know how many spots do you have within the land, and what's where are you at from a capacity standpoint? And then you also have to understand, depending on where the cemetery is located, you know the the value of the the land uh, could be greater, not operated as a cemetery, but as something else. And so you have to kind of understand, okay, what is the land worth? The one we did was in a not not quite so desirable area, and so the highest and best use was probably as a cemetery. And so we looked at okay, what are how long do we think it would take to fill that up? What is the price per uh, per plot? And then you also have to factor in things like uh, capital expenditures that go to maintaining the grounds. And then there's typically a portion of every sale, and this varies by state, but it's required by each state. A portion of that sale goes uh, into a trust that then the interest is used to take care of the grounds into perpetuity. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so it has some 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 long-term implications on the value just because of the families who who they they, they want certainty that the asset's going to um is going to be there uh, ir irrespective of it. Absolutely. Um, so you brought up an interesting concept, though, which is highest and best use versus the actual in in place use. And when when we were looking at or when we've looked at conservation easements for clients, a lot of times or historical building easements, the the same thing comes into play. What's what's the highest and best use of this? real estate versus the 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 in place use and i'm curious like how often is that a a factor for 
for appraisal work. Ben, I'll let you answer that from a real estate standpoint, because I think that was. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that you want to take a look at, at on, on each assignment. It is definitely imperative that a person looks at it. I would say that man, it, it depends on your location, kind of the, the old real estate adage, location, location, location. So that's going to impact things. But you could have a 20, 10 year old quick serve restaurant that gets torn down for a brand new quick serve restaurant, just because they're kind of going out of date. They're, they're rapidly, their models are changing so rapidly that, that what was the most efficient 10, 15 years ago, that might not be it now. So it really it's in, it's in more dynamic and in changing environments or areas that are seeing high value increases that are predominantly hit. I know that Jason had a, a recent assignment out in the Bay Area where they had to take a look at, hey, is this property best used as an auto repair facility or is it to tear it down and, and build something else on it? I wasn't involved with that one at the end, but initially those were some of the things that we were definitely taking into consideration. And you you do need to really look at that just to make sure that you're appropriately valuing the property. Right, right. Well, yeah, for I mean, for gift and estate tax purposes, you you either want you're you're either you're either on one side of it or the other. Either you want a higher value or you want a lower value. If you're employing any one of the freeze techniques, right, where we freeze the value today and and we hope there's appreciation in the future, you you want the the, the lowest possible value. So if it has a higher and better use, I how do you how do you how do you determine like is it just an average between the two values or like I mean the higher and better use it's going to take investment capital in order to realize that higher and better use so how do you how, how do you how do you come up with that the you know the the actual number yeah sure from from a kind of simplistic standpoint you take a look at okay this property let's just go with it's a it's a current quick serve restaurant, you know, a Chick-fil-A or something like that. So you have a Chick-fil-A on it. And as those are predominantly going to be a four lease property. So you take a look at their high, high level. I'm just saying they're, they're NOI associated with the revenue from the lease. I can't imagine that Chick-fil-A is not the highest and best use. I mean, it's one <laughs> yeah. of the most desirable franchises on the planet. Yeah. I, we'll go with Dairy Queen then. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter loves Dairy Queen, so we hit we hit that quite frequently. But um, you'll take a look and you know you apply a cap rate to that, and whatever that value comes in at, you're just looking at the potential value for the underlying dirt. And if the value of the underlying dirt, say your your building came up with a value of 1.5 million, and the value of the dirt comes in at 1.6 million, but it's going to cost two hundred thousand dollars to blade that and get it to actual raw land, then your value as dirt is really at 1.4 million. So the highest and best use in that situation would be to continue utilizing it as a, as a dairy queen or a quick serve restaurant, whatever you have on that parcel. Now, if the value of the dirt came in at 2 million, again, you had $200,000 in demo costs and then you'd be at your 1.8 million. So your 1.8 is above what it currently is at 1.5. You also need to take into consideration, you know, if it was a lease facility, what's the cost associated with terminating that lease um, from the, the landlord standpoint and a few different things like that. But but really it comes down to the current value as is, less demo cost compared to the value of the underlying land as if it was vacant. Right, right, right. So so what what types of assets are are you typically valuing in for, for estate tax purposes. And I'll, I'll ask that to Jason because I, I mean, Ben, it's all, it's all real estate, but I want to get into that too, like what yep. types of real estate, but, but Jason, like what types of things when you're doing estate tax work are you tip, typically valuing? So there's a couple of things that come up quite frequently. A lot of what we see whenever we've got high net worth families is, is a lot of times there's a, uh, what we would call a family limited partnership that gets set up 
And inside of that family limited partnership, that, that legal entity will own a multitude of different assets. And what we see most frequently in there is cash, uh, money market, cash. We see marketable securities, whether that's equities or municipal bonds or treasuries. Um, and then we'll see real estate embedded in there. Oftentimes could be commercial real estate. It could be residential real estate. Could be a number of, you know, very you know, portfolio of real estate. And then the other thing that we'll see sometimes in there is operating businesses. So maybe they own some of their, you know, their their family owned equity in a privately held company uh, within that family limited partnership. And then other times what we'll see is we'll see investments in sometimes private equity or real estate holding funds. So we might see things like carried interest embedded inside of their uh, general partnership interest or limited partnership interest. Yeah, so I imagine those have different levels of effort in, in being able to appraise, right? Because I, I like for a, a, mar a, a marketable security, you know, think municipal bonds or, or a stock that's traded on one of the large exchanges, isn't the value of those what what's quoted on the exchange? Yes, yes. Those are those are fairly easy to find for us. So cash is cash. Marketable securities are fairly easy, and then and once you go from there, things can get a little bit more obscure, require a little more effort. So so like if it's a private equity fund or a hedge fund, like are you able to use what the manager is? reporting is their fair market value or do you actually have to go inside the fund and look at the the components of the fund so more often than not we've got clients that will get a monthly or a quarterly statement usually those statements depending on the size of the fund that they're invested in but a lot of times those statements are audited by an audit firm as part of that fund's annual value you know audit so they'll they'll have the audit performed as part of that, the fund will mark everything up to, to market, and then they'll send their, their quarterly or monthly statement out. So a lot of times we'll use that as a starting point for the value. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. So then, so then the, I guess the hard part, well, the hard parts, I mean, if you have an operating business or real estate, I mean, real estate, you've got to bring in an appraiser. And an operating business what how are you how are you approaching those so from a from an operating business standpoint that's when we would look at you know a, a qualified appraisal of the operating business itself so when we do that we we generally employ one of three approaches and sometimes it can be a reconciliation of multiples sometimes we'll, we'll pick one or the other uh, but we're going to look at an asset approach an income approach and a market approach so in our asset approach we take the balance sheet which typically has all your assets at historical cost. We adjust those to fair market value. We subtract off the fair market value, the liabilities to get to the, the fair market value, the equity on the balance sheet. And then from there, we'll look at the income approach. Uh, the income approach is always kind of forward looking. So it, we'll either do a discounted cash flow analysis or we'll, we'll do what we would call a capitalization of earnings uh, to get our income approach value. And then a market approach, we're going to look at a couple of different things. We'll look at uh, guideline public companies if the company is large enough and we've got some peer comps that we can look at. Other times we're looking at uh, M&A of peer companies that are that are privately held that may have changed hands. And then another one, if we can find it, is uh, prior rounds of financing or sales of the company's existing equity that have happened maybe say in the last 12 months or so. That can give us, if, as long as it's arm's length, a lot of times that can give us a good indication of what the market believes it's worth. And so how do you, so you were talking a little bit, sometimes you use the average of those three, and then sometimes you pick one over the other. Like what, what, what determines that? Well, and so this actually goes to one of the points you made earlier, which is kind of, you know, highest and best use. So what, what we typically would consider is your asset approach. Oftentimes the way that we look at it is that, that would be considered your floor value. So if I've got a number of assets and there were you're saying like book equity adjusted to fair market value. Right. Yeah. Okay. If I'm if I'm a hypothetical willing and able buyer and seller, a prudent investor is not going to sell their business for less than the fair market value of those assets minus the liabilities they have against them. Right. So that's kind of the floor value that we would that we would typically expect to see. And then what we'll say, OK, if these if these assets are being used as a bundle 
and they're generating a positive return that when combined is generating a value greater than what you would see just with the, the bundle of assets themselves, usually in a healthy business, we're going to see an income approach and a market approach that's going to be above what we're seeing from the asset approach. And so in that case, we'll rely on either the income approach or a combination of the income approach and the market approach. And usually if it's going to be the market approach, it's we, we want to see some pretty good comps if we're going to rely on that. Otherwise, we would just use the income approach. Okay. And so if if you get into a situation where the comps and the discounted cash flow are wildly different, how do you reconcile between the two of them, assuming there's no, you, you can't look and say, hi, I guess between those two, it's kind of a hard, harder to say highest to best use, right? Because I mean, that's more of a, a, a distinction between the book equity and this collection of cash flowing assets. Yeah, so when we look at when we look at the market approach, a lot of times what we're going to look at is uh, we're going to say, all right, is this giving is the if the market approach is too far off, we're going to kind of sharpen our pencils and say, all right, did we miss something in one of these approaches? So usually they're they're going to be fairly consistent. Or you know, let's say under the market approach we see a range of multiples, and we know that the the multiples of the comps that we're seeing range from three to to twelve with the median being six. And so what we can do from our income approach is we can say, all right, well, based on our income approach, we're seeing a multiple of seven. So does that make sense based on the range of multiples that we're seeing with our market approach? Is a, does a seven seem reasonable? Is this an average company or does this have some factors that make it slightly above average? And so a lot of times that can kind of give us a, a little bit of a sanity check on where our, our income approach value is coming out at. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, so Ben, you have you have a the similar problem in real estate, right? I mean, don't you use comps as well as income approaches in in terms of of getting to an appraisal, and like, are there specific rules for for how you use those different approaches and how you you meld them together? There, there's definitely you know the preferred appraisal methodology and best practices. But some of the rules are a little bit uh, unwritten. So if you, for most improved properties, owner user property, or unless it's a, a very, very unique property, an owner user or an investment, the two primary approaches you're gonna use are the income and the sales comparison approach. And general rule of thumb is if it's, if those two have a spread of, of you know, greater than 5%, you may have missed something. If it's if it's over ten percent, you definitely missed something. So as Jason kind of alluded to, you, you 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 go back and you look at the different things that you did. You know, maybe your cap rate's too high or too low, or maybe you don't have the best comps that are available. So you really need to kind of take a look at both. Then what what we try and do as appraisers, my sole job is to try and mimic the market. I don't set the market. Those those are the real estate brokers out there. That's not me. I try and indicate what I think a typical market participant would, how they would look at a specific property. So if it's an income producing property and it has 15, 10 years remaining on a lease, the, the greatest emphasis is probably going to be given on the results associated with the income approach. If it's an owner user property, the greatest emphasis is going to be used on the sales comparison approach. The nuances with that is if you're valuing a, a leased property and high likelihood you, for your sales comparison approach, you want to, if at all available, use leased properties that have sold. Same thing for an owner occupied property. You either want to use vacant property or something that was acquired for owner user because when you have a investment property compared to an owner user property wow. there are a few different things like lease up time that do come into play there so those do need to be adjusted for but at the end of the day we try and mirror what the market is indicating and what a typical market participant would how they would view the property right right and so i mean if you hire three different appraisers are what what's the typical spread between 
those appraisers prices like how, if if like how do you how do you pick a good appraiser to get you know, the the in if, if in estate tax yeah. planning you're trying to get a lower valuation I, I mean I guess you probably shouldn't be shopping appraisers but but all thing all else being equal like how, how do you ensure you get an appraiser that is yeah. being thoughtful a, a, a little bit of forethought and questions on the front end go a long way first you want to try and make sure that the person near a hiring that they understand the the nuances with whatever value you're, you're looking at um, before i got back into the accounting world back in about 2012 i had been in the fee world and hadn't been hadn't kept up with a lot of the the asc guidelines and you know financial reporting did it, it took a pretty big swing between 2001 and 2004 during a four year time period i was out of the accounting realm and at that point in time if you would have asked me, hey, can you do a, an ASC 840 compliant appraisal? I my, my, I would have looked at you with glassed over eyes. And so if you get an appraiser that you ask them if they can do something, they get a little glassed over look, just means they don't have experience with that. So you definitely want somebody that has experience. And for gift and estate, you don't want somebody that's done a gift and estate appraisal here or there. You want somebody that's that's familiar with gift and estates that do, does quite a bit of volume in them. And for myself, I know two of the review appraisers at the IRS. So if I ever have questions on what is compliant and what, hey, we're thinking about looking at it from this perspective, I, I just give them a call or shoot them an email and we jump on a call and, and we kind of iron it out at the front end. Yeah. Big thing that you don't want to do is get, get appraisals from somebody that's really not going to be doing the work or involved in the work. You get a large of the, a lot of the larger appraisal companies out there. They might have one or two people that are out there bringing in the vast majority of the work for gift and estate appraisal work. They never touch the actual work. Yeah, they're, they might be MAI designated appraisers and certified general appraisers, but their sole jobs are actual selling of the work. Once they get it in, then they'll send it to wherever that geo leader is. That geo leader passes it on to the senior appraiser in the group. That senior appraiser group passes it on to the trainee. And say you have four appraisal assignments on a similar property, but in four different areas of the country. When you get them all back, you could have four completely different looking documents. And, and that's what you don't want. That's what's going to raise some red flags. So... Yeah. If you have multitude of properties, you want to make sure that whomever you're engaging is involved with the engagement from start to finish. And within the appraisal world, it's you're leveraging down to some staff, but you're making sure that whoever's signing off on the document is intimately involved in reviewing the document, providing correct guidance. And at the end of the day, is able to appropriately make any revisions warranted. Like you said, there, there could be it, real estate appraising, our values are always going to be unbiased, but that's not to say that I'm not good enough to say, hey, is a 6% cap rate on this property better than a 6.25%? Right. I mean, there there is a little bit of room there, um, not a huge amount. You're not going to drive a semi through that, but but there is some room um, to understand what the, the intended use of the appraisal is. And at the end of the day, you know, you want to you want to have somebody that has high levels of credibility. That yeah, has you guys defend it. Yep. If if you ever get called in a an audit, right? That, yep. that appraisal's got to stand up. Yeah, the appraisal's got to stand up. And at the end of the day, you need to make sure that whoever's completing the appraisal, from a you you kind of talked a little bit. You mentioned what the cost is. I could give you a cost. I could say, hey, I can do the single tenant industrial building. I can do an appraisal for you for $2,500. Okay, that's a great great deal. I give you the report back. It's a restricted appraisal report that has one intended user and not enough information in there for the reader to follow the thought process. So you just spent $2,500 on garbage. 
Right. Or right. I can do the same. You'll you'll end up with the same value, but say you know your fee was thirty five hundred dollars, and that's going to give you. It's not an official term, but essentially it used to be called a self-contained appraisal report. And that's what the IRS is looking for is a self-contained appraisal report that leads the reader through all of your thought processes. And at the end of the day is providing a credible value conclusion. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about where you can drive a semi truck through and that's in the discounts or, well, I mean, you probably can't arbitrarily drive a semi truck through it, but, but there are, Jason, if you could help us out, because I know whenever we do appraisals for uh, privately held businesses or real estate or uh, the art, a lot of different things, we are often able to take uh, uh, accounts for lack of control, lack of li liquid uh ability or all sorts of different things. Can you kind of lead us through what what the different discounts are and how, how they're applicable and what the basic ranges are? Yeah. So uh, typically, whenever we're valuing a privately held business, there's, there's two main discounts that you're going to see off the legal entity value. And, and this is usually when we're valuing minority interests. So let's say we have a 10% interest in a privately held business. The first one is going to be a discount for lack of control. So what we need to do is, you know, we look at the value of the business on a control basis. So as if it's 100% owned, all of the values that we get when we look at our, our opinions of value based on market data. So a lot of what we do is discount rates and things like that are all based on market data. So the number that comes out is usually a control marketable value. So in the, in the event that we're doing a minority interest, let's say 10%, we need to take a discount for lack of control, and then we would take a discount for lack of marketability. So the 10% owner doesn't have the ability to make changes to the way the business operates. They can't make changes to compensation structures. They can't liquidate assets. You're pretty much along for the ride. So when you look at that controlling value, you need to take a discount for lack of control to say, all right, well, this is what it's worth when you don't have the ability to do whatever you want. Oftentimes, those are going to be based on data that we pull out of the market itself. You, if it's an operating business, it's going to be based on control premiums that were paid in the marketplace. With control premiums, we're, we're a little bit, we got to do some analysis to make sure they're not strategic synergistic premiums, but we're looking more for financial buyers. So we're going to look at the inverse of control premiums. And then we will look at discounts for lack of marketability. We calculate the discount for lack of marketability based on certain restricted stock studies. So there have been a number of studies that have happened in the past based on various metrics, things like the size of the equity, profitability of the firm, number of assets, and that can kind of hone in, okay, based on where this lands, what should our discount for lack of marketability be? Uh, combined, those discounts can range anywhere from 20, 20% to 50%, depending on the restrictions and the amount of control that, that, that is inherent in the interest that we're valuing. So there's, but there's degrees of control, right? So like I, I've seen it where family members, where the uh, generation one, G1 might have control right now, but G2 has which the transfers being made might have a, a veto right or some other extenuating control. How do you how do you how do you account for those types of atypical control mechanisms? Yeah, so there's some subjectivity that would go into it. A lot of times if we're valuing, so in our practice, if we've got a let's say we've got a 50% interest. So we don't have a minority interest, but we don't have somebody that can you know send a hundred percent interest. So smack dab in the middle of 50%. I don't have the ability to make any decisions that I want to make on my own, can't change certain things, but I can veto decisions, right? So I have some control. So a lot of times in that case, what we'll say is, all right, let's say the discount for lack of control for a hundred for a for a five percent interest or a one percent interest would be twenty five percent. We'll take half of that and we'll say, all right, well, in this case, we don't have the ability, so we're not going to take the full twenty five, but maybe we get whatever that is. Uh, 
12 and a half percent or yeah. something like that, right? And that we would hit with that. And that makes sense, right? We can we can support that. We can sit down across from an agent and say, yeah, what we think that there's there is some level of control that we're recognizing, but we also know that you, know, you can't do whatever you want. Right, right. And, and Ben, do you get into this this discount? Because like, what what if you're just a tenant in common, or, or you're you're a you own a uh, a, uh, a condominium unit in a uh, parcel of land, or or some of these other you know ownership formats? Yeah, I don't get into those. When you have those restrictions associated with ownership, you're the the best way to approach those from the real estate standpoint is. For your comparable sales, you definitely want to use prop sales that have similar restrictions in place. From your cap rates that you're utilizing, you want to drive those from similar properties that have all those CCNRs in place. And then after that, I would pull Jason and his team in to do an entity level analysis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're still use the valuations guys to 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 figure out if if yeah if it's if it's in a limited partnership. You, you value the land and then you take the value of a partnership unit in that limited partnership unit. Is that the way it works? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And okay. then and sometimes even if we've got, let's say we've just got tenants in common, we'll be asked to do discount studies on what that would be just if, if you know, for, without the legal entity in place and we'll do the discount studies on those. And it's based upon many of the same principles as we would see uh, within the legal entity context. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's, that's, that's super helpful. So, I mean, given, given the current landscape, I mean, do you, do you feel like there's an acceleration in the, I mean, well, let me ask this question a couple of different ways, right? So, so rates are relatively high. You know, I think it was, there was broad consensus, at least around the beginning of the year that we were going to get it you know, a, a couple, if not four race, rate cuts. Uh, now that leads into cap rates. It also leads into uh, discount rates for, for uh, discounted cash flow purposes. And, you know, uh, about a week ago, I think the Fed chairman kind of reversed decisions on there. And, and so, so now the the cost of capital doesn't necessarily look like it did a, a week ago. It's certainly the long end of the curve came up and, and the mid, mid of the curve came up. How is that impacting, how is that going to impact appraisals and valuations of, of real estate and privately held businesses? Go ahead, Ben, if you want to well, tackle. From a, from a real estate perspective, transactional activity, I was looking at the, digging into this actually last week. We're at the lowest rate across the United States transactional activity for commercial real estate that we have been since the financial How do you get enough cost then? Like yeah. if, and so if there's, you're always backward looking on comps, right? You're yeah. looking at the last six months of comp, comps. It's got, they've got potentially better cap rates, better by virtue of better short-term rates. How do, yeah. you, how do you account for that? So you, you, you need to be a little bit creative and I think a little bit outside of the boxes that we're possibly taught in any real estate appraisal classes that you're thinking about. And I always go back to if I'm an investor or I'll even talk to some investors or owner operators or whatever the property type is, I ask them what they would do, how they would look at it. So maybe it's, I'll go back to a QSR in Colorado. There just haven't been that many transactions in Colorado. And they're, they'll be like, look, we would look at similar property types, whatever that QSR was, throughout the region. So not just Colorado. We'd, we'd dig down into New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and, and we'd make adjustments for the locations rather than adjustments for the tenancy and the, In the order risk to get associated enough, with enough, enough transaction volume to, to value the property? Correct. Correct. Because... Yeah. And and you really need to be extra diligent when when you're doing your research to make sure that the the transactions you're utilizing, the sales that you're utilizing, aren't atypical. Um, that you don't have. I mean, from an appraisal standpoint, it's always got to be a typical, typically motivated buyer and seller. And a lot of we're seeing 
in the office space in areas where you know, it's no longer a typical motivated seller. So, <laughs> you, yeah, you really need to understand that. And I remember back in 2009, 2010, I did you know a fair amount of expert witness testimony associated with with that. And and the key to winning our argument was getting the judge to understand that her appraisal guidelines and principles and regulations with USPAP, you a a sale a transaction is based upon a typically motivated arm's length transaction. So. At that point in time, some of the stuff we were seeing opponents using as sales, it could have just been the sale of the underlying note, that it was never adequately exposed to the market. It was some crazy stuff going on there. But you just need to you know, do a little bit more due diligence than you were doing two years ago and making sure that everything is appropriately arm's length transaction and, and expand your market parameters if need be. Right, right, right. You know, and... And really kind of try and do your best to compare markets to markets. I mean, there are just certain markets that that aren't going to be really appropriate to compare each other to. Um, but but you do the best that you can with the 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 more limited data that we do have. Because definitely transactional volume is across it's it's down across the board for all real estate, commercial real estate sectors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Yeah, because there's just not a lot of buyers and sellers agreeing on on right. Price. Yep the yeah. the sellers the sellers they still want the cap rates that they're getting two to three years ago. Right. The buyers are like, look, if I give you the cap rate, I'm already and I'm doing any type of leveraging. I'm already upside down on the deal, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, I think some of the sellers are feeling that way too. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to pay off 100 percent of the debt if if I don't get the, the 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 cap rate that was in place two years ago. Yep. Yep. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, just the capacity in the industry, given the fact that we've got these estate tax rates sunsetting at the end of 2025. And, and, and I, I know you guys have both been in, in crunches before where there just wasn't enough estate, enough valuation appraisal capacity in order to get all of the, the work done that the, these, uh, Families needed to get done in, in order to get their their estate plan up to par. Uh, so, it, it, what what are the like? How long does it take to get an a, a evaluation or an appraisal? What's the process, and how how time intensive is it? And I mean, what what do what do what do people need to expect when they're uh, uh, one or the both of you in order to get estate tax appraisals or valuations done? So from the, on the business valuation side, we typically ask in a, in, you know, in a normal environment for four to six weeks from the date that we request, we get engaged and we, we, we request information, we get the information. So that gives us enough time to get our model populated, to pull in all of our comps, to synthesize the data, schedule meetings with management, really understand the operations of the business. We like to share, you know, if we have the opportunity to go through a draft with the client to make sure we haven't misinterpreted anything or missed any facts, because there is information asymmetry sometimes. And so we want to make sure that we've got all of the information that would readily be available and relevant to us. And so from that standpoint, we typically ask for about four to six weeks. Uh, Usually the big documents that we're going to want to understand are five to seven years of historical tax returns and or um, financial statements for the business, and then any projections that are prepared in the ordinary course of business. So anything that, that management looks at over a five to 10 year horizon is usually going to be, those are the big items that we ask for. And then there will be one off things, but though that's really what we need to get started for the most part. And Ben, is that the the, the same in the for the, the real estate process or? Slightly nuanced for the real estate. A lot of time what we're doing uh, flows into what Jason and his team's doing. So our turnaround times, we're typically about three to four weeks. Um, okay. We can do quicker, but you know, the, with quicker, it's going to just require a little bit more fee for that rush time. But yeah, three to four weeks that allows, that gives us the opportunity to get a, a handle on the property 
get all of our due diligence done. Our due diligence is more associated with operations of the real estate. So the historical financials for the real estate for the past three years or year to date are trailing 12 months. And any major capital expenditures, obviously we would want leases or a rent schedule that has details of the lease leases that, that show who is ex responsible for what expenses. So you know, is it a triple net where the tenant's responsible for everything or a, a gross where the landlord's responsible for everything or some somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, hey, I really appreciate the two of you guys taking time this afternoon to to discuss these things with me. I, I know a lot of our family office clients are this is on their mind right now. And I I I, I you know I think we we did a good job of laying out like the urgency if if you want to get planning done in 2024, you you probably better get started sooner rather than later. And uh, both you guys uh, have have capacity right now, but that as we get closer to the end of the year, that that may not be true. And and one item of note, uh, it's it's not only the sunsetting of the the current exemption, but I believe that the rate's going to be bumping up from forty to forty five percent as well. So you know, there's going to be an additional tax on that. Oh, the in twenty twenty six. Correct. Yes, yes, that's a, a very good point. Yeah, you've got a, a rate change in the underlying estate tax. Yeah, fair. All right. Well, look, we're we're right at time. So again, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, to join me and lots of good material here. And uh, thank you again.